Thanks so much everyone for joining us today. I'm gonna to go ahead and get started with a bit of housekeeping before diving into some announcements and the event today. If you would like to access the live transcription and cannot see it now, click on the live transcripts button on your screen or on the three dots where it reads more and click on the live transcripts button there. If you have questions or need assistance, message the panelists. Thank you to Susan and Alina from Pro Bono ASL for providing ASL interpretation and helping to make this event more accessible. The webinar is being recorded and we'll send the video of the event to all registrants and attendees in the coming days. DPA has a YouTube channel called DPA Voices where all of our virtual events like webinars, trainings, and research roundtables have been archived. You can find the link to the site in the chat. After a presentation and a moderated discussion, we'll have time for audience questions. So please feel free to submit questions throughout the webinar in the Q&A box on your screen or in the chat box. We'll compile them and then ask them at the end. Now for some introductions. My name is Eliza Cohen and I'm the Research Coordinator at Drug Policy Alliance's Department of Research and Academic Engagement. For those who don't know, Drug Policy Alliance is the country's leading organization in the US working to end the war on drugs and build drug policies grounded in science, compassion, health, and human rights. Our priorities include ending the criminalization of drug possession, repairing the consequences of decades of unequal and brutal enforcement, and building effective community-based responses to drug use by advancing evidence-informed health services to reduce risks and harms. The Department of Research and Academic Engagement, or DRE, which is my department, works to bridge the divide between research and effective drug policies. We provide research support to our policy colleagues to ensure that we're promoting the most evidence-based policies. We work with academics by providing media, advocacy, and research translation trainings. And we host events like these where we platform the latest drug policy data and research. If you'd like to get in touch with our department or join our department listserv, you can email me, Aliza Cohen, at the email in the chat. Now for a few announcements, please feel free to join in the conversation on Twitter. We'll put the handles in the chat. And for some upcoming events, on April 12th, DPA is co-hosting a book talk with Haymarket Books and others on Whiteout, How Racial Capitalism Changed the Color of Opioids in America, a new book out just this month by my colleague Jules Netherland and Helena Hansen and David Herzberg. By looking at the role of whiteness in the opioid crisis, Whiteout shows how racial capitalism shapes not only racially segregated labor, but also consumer markets, and in doing so, harms everyone, including white people. We'll put the link in the chat to buy the book and to register for the event. Please save the date for October 18th through 21st in Phoenix, Arizona for the International Drug Policy Reform Conference. Reform is the world's premier gathering of drug policy reformers coming together to learn, collaborate, strategize, and mobilize to end the drug war. More than 1,200 attendees representing 50 countries joined us at our last conference in 2019. <laughs> Registration and scholarship applications will open in April, and you can find more information and travel discounts at the link in the chat. We hope you'll join us. Lastly, the Drug Policy Alliance is a nonprofit, and we get by with donations and support from members. If you have found this event and other events helpful, please consider donating to support our work, and we'll put the link in the chat. Before we introduce our speakers today, I want to provide some context about the current moment. We're in a moment where public drug use, unsheltered houselessness, and encampments increasingly dominate public conversation and media headlines. I wanna to frame today's discussion with this. It's imperative that we recognize that, quote, social problems like substance use disorder, like crime, like houselessness occur not because of individual failure, but because of systemic failures like government abandonment and disinvestment, economic insecurity, drug prohibition, and a lack of robust, accessible health care. And I ask all of us here today to question why our collective instinct in the US is to disappear people to jails, detention centers, and hospitals, rather than create true community-based and community-driven health and safety. 
This current moment requires that we turn inward to challenge divisions between people deserving of care and people undeserving of care, and that we center the self-determination and autonomy of unhoused people and people who use drugs. And with that, I'm really excited to introduce our speakers um, for today. You can find extensive bios um, on our Eventbrite page. I have the link in the chat. Um, but in brief, um, I'll introduce Paul Bowden, who's the Executive Director of Western Regional Advocacy Project, who we'll be hearing from later today. And now I'll hand it over to Do Dr. Stephen Wong, the Director of MAP Center for Urban Health Solutions in Toronto, Canada. Take it away, Dr. Wong. Thanks very much. Uh, so I'm going to start sharing uh, slides. Just give me a second. And hopefully, can you just tell me if I'm showing my slides? Uh, you're able that looks to see great. Them? Okay, Perfect. great. Excellent. So, uh, just to introduce myself. Uh, uh, so, I'm going to be speaking about housing first, efficacy limitations, and future directions. Just to introduce myself, uh, I'm the director of MAP Center for Urban Health Solutions, and I'll explain a little bit about what we that center is. Uh, I'm a a clinician, a physician by training, and uh, uh, I'm uh, a researcher with a focus on homelessness, housing, and health. Uh, so the MAP Center for Urban Health Solutions is based at St. Michael's Hospital, uh, which is part of the Unity Health Toronto Network uh, in Toronto, Canada. Uh, we're dedicated to creating a healthier future for all. We're a group of about 30 scientists who uh, address complex urban health issues. And we really focus on solutions that address social determinants of health and increase health equity. And we, we're, our aim is to have a real world impact through our partnerships and collaborations with community members, policymakers, and service providers. If you're interested in learning more about our center, you can go to our website at maphealth.ca. So I, I'm going to actually uh, talk to you a little bit about the housing first model for addressing homelessness. Uh, I'm going to uh, actually, I believe that many of you may already be very familiar with it, but I do want to give you a little bit of background just uh, uh, and explain how uh, this model works and how I've been involved in doing research uh, on the model. So just reduced to uh, very simple basics. The Housing First model consists of the provision, immediate provision of permanent housing linked with appropriate supports in order to immediately end homelessness. And the Housing First model is really based on five simple principles. One is immediate access to housing with no housing readiness conditions. And specifically, that means no prerequisite that someone with uh, mental health conditions is receiving psychiatric treatment and no precondition that a person, people who use substances be abstinent or be engaged in, in, in treatment for their substance use prior to housing. It emphasizes consumer choice and self-determination uh, in, the, uh, in their move to housing and is, has a recovery orientation focusing on the abilities of people and their capacity to achieve wellness, regardless of the challenges they face. The, the supports that are provided are individualized and, and person-centered. And lastly, the approach emphasizes social and community integration. So the housing first approach is in contrast to what's the traditional or uh, model uh, or stair-step model in which it was believed that people living on the street need to move into shelter first. And if they are compliant with that and get treatment for their mental illness or substance use conditions, then they can move into transitional housing. And then if they're successful in transitional housing, they can move on to permanent housing. And of course, I think we all realize that what this model means uh, is that in practice, very, very few people ever make it to the top of this uh, daunting staircase. And so the housing first model simply says that we're gonna just get rid of the staircase 
and simply say that people can move from wherever they are, whether it's on the street or in shelters, directly into permanent housing and with no requirements of, of treatment adherence or compliance. So this model was really um, uh, pioneered by Sam Simbaris in New York City with the Pathways mo uh, uh, to Housing model. And uh, the reason that I got involved in this work is that I had the opportunity to be a researcher in the uh, at-home Shea study. So I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about this research study. Um, just a first uh, a, a word for those of you who don't speak French, chez soi simply means at home in French, and it reflects the bilingual nature of Canada speaking both English and French as official languages. So this study was funded uh, uh, actually 15 years ago by the federal government of Canada. Uh, uh, $110 million was dedicated to this project as a demonstration project of the housing first approach in five cities, and they're shown here on this map, Vancouver, British Columbia, Winnipeg in Manitoba, Toronto, Ontario, uh, Montreal, Quebec, and Moncton, New Brunswick. Uh, the, the study was uh, designed as a randomized controlled trial where uh, 2,154 people who were homeless were in, the, in these cities were randomized to either receive the housing first approach or usual care, or essentially, essentially to be controls who did not receive any specific intervention uh, through the study. Uh, but of course they were able to receive the services that were available, otherwise available in their communities. Um, a hundred percent of the participants had serious mental illness because this was a uh, inclusion criteria for being in the study. Uh, uh, having a substance use disorder or using substances was neither a uh, qualifying nor disqualifying condition. And uh, in our study, 35% of participants had a substance use disorder. So a little bit about the design of the study. Um, the, we conceived of individuals as having either high needs or moderate needs for supports as they made the transition from homelessness into housing. And so what happened is that we, what we did is we uh, stratified or grouped people according to whether they appeared to have high needs or moderate needs. And this was based primarily on their use of uh, inpatient psychiatric services or uh, justice involvement in the two years prior to their enrollment in the study. Uh, and also whether or not they had a psychotic illness. Uh, so for people who had high needs, they were randomized to either housing first associated with supports in the form of assertive community treatment or treatment as usual. That's this group here on the upper band. And in the lower band, if they had moderate needs, it, they were randomized to either receive the intervention, which was housing first with intensive case management or treatment as usual. So I'm going to share with you some of the bottom line findings of the study, and then I'm going to go on to talk to you about what I'm sure is what you're particularly interested in is the implications of the study for people who use uh, drugs. So the first bottom line finding from this study, which was, I should just mention, is the largest randomized controlled trial to ever be conducted uh, with participants who were experiencing homelessness, uh, and also the largest randomized controlled trial ever of the housing first approach. It looked, uh, we looked at housing stability, and the bottom line, as you can see from this graph, the green line shows the housing first group, and the blue line shows the control or treatment as usual group. And what you can see is that Within a matter of months, the, the, the numbers here indicate months after randomization, uh, we saw a very rapid uh, increase in the number percent of people who were stably housed. And this number or percentage was dramatically and significantly higher than that in people who were randomized to usual care. So the first line, uh, 
bottom line finding here is that uh, Housing First rapidly ended what was in most cases chronic homelessness in people experiencing mental illness. So we then had the opportunity in Toronto, where I'm located, to do extended follow-up over six to seven years with these participants. And what we showed on the left-hand side among people with high needs and on the right-hand side among people with moderate needs is that the differences in housing stability, the, the housing stability that was achieved through Housing First was sustained over this extended time period, up to six years, and that the differences between the two groups was also sustained, meaning that Housing First was effective in reducing homelessness and it was better than the usual processes in each of these five in, in Toronto over a six year period. So, uh, and again, I just mentioned on a personal note, I had the opportunity, I was at a symposium uh, just uh, last week and we were talking about Housing First and someone in the audience asked, so uh, how do we know does Housing First work? And before I was able to, to talk about the data in these slides, someone in the back of the room, basically who was a participant in the study, uh, actually put up her hand and said, I know it works because I'm, I'm evidence of this. I was in the study and I'm, I'm housed. It's, uh, you know, it's actually been, uh, for, for, for her, actually, it's been about 10 years now. And she was there as a, a part, as a research team member for uh, a uh, actually a drug policy working group that was at the symposium. So it was really just uh, uh, really uh, nice to see the 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 human face of housing first uh, for for myself. Seeing that it was really moving. So the the effects of housing first are actually also seen on healthcare utilization. And interestingly, among the high needs people, it significantly reduced the number of days that people spent in hospital and the number of ED visits. However, interestingly, it did not do this in the moderate needs group. It actually, there was, it was associated with an increased number of hospitalizations. So I think the bottom line here is that uh, ending, home, uh, ending homelessness through Housing First has different effects depending on which uh, the, the, the level of needs and the level of uh, healthcare utilization that the person has prior to being uh, in Housing First. So now I'm gonna focus on our findings from this study and other studies on the effects of Housing First on substance use. So I'm first gonna look at the question, does Housing First, and essentially does having someone who is homeless moving into housing affect their level of substance use. And sometimes we have data on alcohol and drug use separately, and sometimes it's combined. So first I'm gonna show you this data from Toronto. So at 24 months, at which point, as you saw from the graphs, about 85% of the people in Housing First had been successfully housed, and very few of those in the control group had been housed. Well, what we found was that alcohol problems were significantly lower in the Housing First group. And the amount of money that people spent on alcohol in the last 30 days was significantly lower in the Housing First group. In contrast, when we looked at people's reports about drug problems, there was no significant difference in the drug problems that they reported in the last 30 days or in the amount of money they spent had spent on drugs in the last 30 days. And I'm just going to mention that at the bottom of each slide, there are, there are references uh, to the articles if you're interested in seeing the actual research articles that uh, uh, this, the, these results are from. So we also looked at in Toronto at the long-term effects, because you might imagine that the early effects of being housed might vary and might be greater or less over six years. So interestingly, at six years, when we looked at, in Toronto at substance use related problems self-reported using an instrument called the GAIN SS, what we found was that there was no significant difference between the housing first group and the control group. So uh, again, 
the the and so actually I'll I'll continue and there's this is actually quite consistent with the findings of other studies. So remember the this the at home chez soi study was done in five Canadian cities. So there was a similar study done in Vancouver, and they also looked at people at 24 months looking at daily substance use measured by something called the Maudsley Addiction Profile. And they found no difference between the housing first and control groups at 24 months. And interestingly, when they restricted the analysis to people who reported substance use at baseline, because remember, not everyone in the study used substances, some did not use any substances, but when restricted to those who did use substances, again, there was no difference in daily substance use uh, as uh, measured by their uh, instrument. So these are findings from the at-home Chez Swa study and a meta-analysis, which is a combined analysis of many different studies. This includes the at-home Chez Swa study, but also includes other studies uh, conducted uh, in the US of uh, Housing First, looking at the fact of Housing First and substance use they concluded that there was no clear difference in substance use between the housing first and control groups. So just, I'm gonna pause here for a second and just point out that uh, this is a glass half full or glass half empty kind of situation because uh, when looking at this outcome of whether or not housing first affects the amount or degree of substance use among people who were previously homeless, some people had argued that, you know, providing people with housing would likely increase their use of substances, that, that this would essentially was going to uh, uh, result in a, a license to use, uh, that it would have adverse effects. There were others who argued that housing is a prerequisite to uh, improving people's health, a, a, a necessary uh, starting point, and that providing housing for people would actually allow people to reduce their substance use. It turns out that neither of these, uh, 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 I guess, uh, hypotheses is supported by the data. The, 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 the results from this rigorous randomized controlled trials suggests that it has neither, uh, it does not increase, providing housing does not increase or decrease substance use among people who, uh, 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 who were previously homeless. And I think that uh, it's just important to realize that uh, I'm, I'm emphasizing in my presentation the evidence from randomized controlled trials because Data from observational studies, when you simply follow people who, who get a, a, uh, a, a, an intervention, are really subject to a lot of risk of bias because sometimes people just, uh, they, they get better spontaneously and um, it's sometimes it's hazardous to attribute that improvement or, or in some cases the deterioration that people experience to something that was done for them. And so it's really important to focus on evidence from randomized controlled trials that really provide us with the most rigorous uh, and reliable information. So uh, moving along, uh, I'm gonna address a second and separate question. So well, up till now I was talking about whether or not housing first re results in reduced substance use. Now, this is a separate question. Does substance use uh, alter the effectiveness of housing first? In other words, people might would say, oh, of course it will work for people with schizophrenia, but if the person has substance use problems, it's not gonna work or it's not gonna work as well. So that was, again, a hypothesis that, or something that you might've heard people talking about, saying about housing people who are homeless. Now, the, what this study showed uh, using data from the at-home Chesua study is that, first of all, it is true that people with substance use disorder in the study spent less time in stable housing compared to people who didn't have substance use disorder. And this, I mean, I think this is not surprising to those of us who work in the field. Essentially, what that means is that 
if you take someone who has both a, a mental illness and a substance use disorder, in other words, someone with a, a dual diagnosis, someone has both, they're going to, the, the time that they stand, spend in stable housing is going to be lower than someone who has mental illness alone. And, and that's not surprising. But is very really, really important though is that this study found that the effect of housing first did not vary by the person's substance use uh, uh, disorder status. So in other words, regardless of whether a person had substance use disorder or not, housing first was equally effective. And uh, the, uh, the effects of housing first on other outcome measures was again similar, regardless of whether the person had substance use disorder or not. So the real, the, the real conclusion here is that um, while housing first does not reduce or increase substance use, it actually is equally effective for people with and without substance use disorders. So the next study is actually one that addresses the question of harm reduction. So I did mention earlier that the housing first philosophy has harm reduction as one of its pillars. This is a summary from a systematic review, a recent systematic review, looking at harm reduction and housing first. And its main findings, and these are qualitative findings, are that the harm reduction philosophy that is incorporated in Housing First can first of all foster improved working relationships between clients and service providers. And I think that this is something that I think everyone on this webinar is already well aware of. That in, in the context of Housing First, the, the, the harm reduction approach reduced clients' stress and their fear of judgment, the, 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 the sense that they needed to um, you know, conceal their substance use in order to retain their housing. Um, from the uh, pro provider's perspective, the people who are working with people who had moved into housing, it increased their flexibility because, because the housing, as I mentioned, was not linked to being abstinent or being engaged in any sort of treatment. They were able to engage with people in a flexible way, but it did create challenges for the service providers as well, who often were asking themselves, when should I intervene? Uh, am I intervening too much or too little? Am I providing adequate support for my clients? So the, the key factors, so, so the, key, the key ingredient here is the relationship between clients and service providers. And again, this is something that I'm sure everyone on this webinar already knows, but it is the relationship is central and the key factors that affect those relationships in the context of a housing first program, moving people from homelessness into housing is first of all, the service providers interpersonal style. Secondly, their patients, their ability to maintain appropriate boundaries and their unconditional acceptance of their clients. And I think what you can see it very, is very clear from these, 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 this summary of findings is that this, these are not uh, aspects of a Housing First program that are easy to quantify. And it's really important to realize that what, uh, what this means is that it's a lot of this is going to be in the implementation of the program because you can have a housing first program and say that you have a harm reduction philosophy, but you know, are your what are who who are your 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 case managers and act team providers? What how do they work with people? Who who are they? How do they how do they relate to them on an interpersonal level? Those are things that we have to pay a lot of attention to, and they're not really captured in this uh, kind of quantitative uh, view of housing first. And so uh, I think this is just a good uh, example of the, the old saying, uh, or the, the saying that not everything that can be count, not everything that can be counted is important, and not everything that is important can be counted. So um, moving along, 
I just wanted to point out that the um, the the, the um, housing first can be somewhat of a catchphrase, and I think there is a danger or a risk to thinking of housing first as the solution for homelessness. Um, and again, I think this relates to the fact that we often tend to confuse individual level solutions with population level solutions. Housing first is an intervention that can help end chronic homelessness for individuals. It is, it is a program, but reducing for, if it's a program for individuals, but reducing homelessness really requires intervention at a system-wide policy level. We cannot reduce homelessness in our communities by simply saying, we're just going to create a housing first program. We have to address the underlying drivers of homelessness. So this is a very complex diagram of the social determinants of health, but I think it really is a nice way to understand the, 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 the drivers of unwellness and inequities in our society. So just here on the left, and very importantly, are the socioeconomic and political context that drive the structural determinants of health inequities. These are how we, how we structure our social policies, our public policies, our government. These policies uh, affect uh, socioeconomic position, things like education, occupation, income, and are highly, uh, obviously, all of which are highly mediated by social class, gender, and racism. And then these factors then have an impact on people's material circumstances, their housing, the availability of food, um, behavioral and biological factors, Here's the health system as well. And that these have then an impact on individual level health. When we talk about housing first, we're talking about altering people's material circumstances, but we're not addressing these upstream factors on the left-hand side of the diagram. And so it's no surprise that we are, you know, we might be able to end people's homelessness by working at this level but we're not really addressing the underlying uh, drivers of the problems that we're confronting. And so this is, again, a, a very simple diagram to really explain, uh, in my mind, how I think about this. We can look at an individual and see this vicious cycle very clearly, that having no housing or poor or inadequate housing leads to poor health. Having poor health leads to the person losing their housing or having very poor housing. And so we can see this vicious cycle very clearly at the individual level. But it's really risky to stop there because what we're not looking at is the ocean that we're swimming in. The, with the, this individual level vicious cycle is really occurring within the context of the water that we swim in. And that's why it's now I sh I'm showing the fish because we, we take our uh, the, the structures around us and the society we've built around us for granted. It's part of the air we breathe and the water we drink. And we, we need to obviously look upstream at the uh, structural causes of homelessness and ill health. Uh, and obviously for your organization, uh, drug policy, not just individual drug use. And so I'm going to stop there and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh, I, this is my email address and this is our website if you're interested in learning more about uh, MAP. Thanks so much for that, Dr. Wang. That was a really uh, fascinating presentation. I'm going to invite um, Paul to come on and I'll go ahead and ask him some questions and then invite you back. Um, if that's okay. Um, okay, let me just. Or, okay, do you want to do me now or the Q and A? Yeah, let's let's start with you. I mean, just to start, right. um, I want to ask if you if you have any reflections on Dr. Hong's presentation. Um, if you want to offer any reflections, but also ask you, I think the end of the, that presentation was a really a really good setup for the conversation I want to have with you about looking at some of the um, 
the systemic drivers of houselessness. Um, so maybe we can start there. And oftentimes we think about, oftentimes houselessness is phrased right as an individual moral failing. Um, and I have a hunch you think of it in a different way. So um, can I ask you to start there and how you conceptualize sort of the problem of, of homelessness? Well, yeah, thanks. And um, I, I, that was a very interesting presentation and I appreciated it very much and your work. Um, we do take here at RAP, the Western Regional Advocacy Project is a, a almost 19 year old uh, group of organizations that formed ourselves to, to regionalize. We're a regional project, but we have a national focus. Um, our collective work in LA, San Francisco, Oakland, Portland, Denver, and various other cities so that we could start having a national impact. Um, because what we were seeing as community members coming up from the streets and, and others that are just poor people and just others, anybody in our community, was the separation once we lost our housing, suddenly it was we were the homeless. And we started getting studied. And for 40 fucking years, we've been studying the shit out of homelessness without addressing the structural issues that the doctor brought up. And we're always studying the individuals that are homeless, as opposed to why does homelessness exist? I mean, this isn't rocket science, folks. Nothing ends homelessness like a home. Now, you have a support system that people with different disabilities might need to access, and they happen to be poor. And when that happens, they end up being called the homeless. And they end up being studied as if we're some unique animal that came up from the waters, from the ocean. We're not. We're just community members that ended up ass out in the street. And I think if we would simplify this process, we've created a whole federal bureaucracy. When you talk about, well, have it with no preconditions at the intake, housing should be with no preconditions at an intake. You should be able to walk down to the public housing authority building and get a goddamn place to live. That's not so complicated, regardless of your skin color, your, your disability, whatever, your education level. And we're not separate subjects to be prodded and poked and picked apart and prioritized when we actually try to access something. And, and that's where I think we've really missed the boat and miss the neoliberal context of why racism and classism is so prevalent in our country, why we have a war on drugs, a war on the homeless. No, man, do a war on humanity and just call it what it is because that's what you're doing. You're attacking human beings. You're sweeping human beings. You're incarcerating human beings. And that's the context that I think we should have more studies about is how are we gonna flip the, la the language and the policy priorities and the funding priorities? We do $200 billion a year in America subsidizing the housing of wealthy homeowners. And we don't prod them, we don't intake them, we don't follow them for six years. Yeah, of course we're still, HUD spent $4 million went back when they actually gave a shit about families and they were doing some housing in 2008, 2009 during the TARP tour families actually got some of the benefit of the largesse of the TARP money, and they did rapid rehousing. And for three years, then the money ran out, but for three years, everybody was like, holy shit, families that get a place to live stay there? Of course, of course they do. What do you think we are, idiots? Yeah, I've been homeless, and yeah, I've been housed, and I'm a homeowner now. And I can tell you right now, my health is better. My dental work is better. <coughs> Everything in my life is better, <coughs> stably housed, than when I was bouncing around and couch surfing and in and out of the streets. Like, it's just not that complicated, folks. And, and it really, we would much rather, you know, HUD was masterful in stealing the language housing first. We'd been talking about the need for housing since 1983 when we opened our emergency shelter goddamn programs. And then HUD makes it a program. There's no, there's no line item for the funding for housing first. 
We've destroyed over 487,000 units of public housing between Hope Six and neoliberal economic policies at HUD. Over 486,000 public housing units since the advent of contemporary homelessness in the early 1980s. You want a recipe for continued homelessness in the United States? Do a study on that. When you take away 500,000 units of the housing that you set aside for the poorest of the poor in your community, you're going to need a housing first program. You sure as hell are. And that's where we really need to refocus our debate and refocus our priorities. Thanks, thanks for that, Paul. Um, I want to I want to point something out in what you said because I I think people may have missed it because you said it quickly, right? You talked about how um, housing first has been a rhetorical device that's been co-opted by HUD. Can you say more about that? And can you say more about um, what you've seen different housing first models look like, right? Because they housing first looks. Yeah, can you talk about that a bit? Well, I mean. There's certain things, point in time headcounts. I mean, there's certain things that HUD comes up with that's attached to funding streams. And so it becomes the language of the service provider community and of the media and of the politicians. And Housing First is the current you know, iteration of that, but it's not the first and it won't be the last. And the whole step thing that the doctor presented in the, like, Everybody knew that was asinine at the time that they tried to come up with it. But then it was, we need transitional housing because these fucked up homeless people are not housing ready. And all of the programs and all of the studies and all of the conferences were geared towards housing ready, how to get homeless people housing ready with transitional housing programs. I mean, my God. Or I was a case manager coming off the streets for 58 mentally ill people in an SRO program in San Francisco. I had a GED, like, but case managers are cheaper than the residential treatment systems that we used to have when we actually gave a shit about poor people with a disability and them living in the community. And we found that to be just too expensive for our, our health delivery systems. And all of a sudden case management became a, a treatment modality when in fact case management is just trying to hook somebody up with the support systems that they need. So we continued to decimate the support systems that people needed and we hired case managers to screen them and do intake on them and provide support. You're really doing behavior modification is what you're doing. Because the support that they, the treatment that people with disabilities actually need, whether it be an addiction or a mental illness or whatever, or a broken leg, you know, you wouldn't fix somebody's broken leg with a case manager. You would actually try to find a freaking doctor and get a cast put on it. But we, when it comes to the human beings that are indigent in this country, we try to fix them because God forbid that economic stimulus isn't different from charity. You know, we do the mortgage interest support for homeowners and we call it economic stimulus. We do a housing subsidy for a poor family and we call it charity. That's where we're missing the boat on this shit. Thanks, and you're, you, you touched on this a little and Dr. Wong, I wanna bring you back in in a second, but before that, um, Paul, I wanna ask you why the existing, some of the existing models like quote transitional housing, halfway housing, three quarter housing, things like that are so unappealing, dehumanizing um, towards towards unhoused people. Can you touch on that a bit? I mean, they're they're better than a poke in the eye with a sharp stick, but they're they're nothing without a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, and and it's cosmetic as opposed to human caring. And, and it's not what, when you look at the issue of homelessness, that's why we called our very first study in 2006, you know, without housing, like that's what we need to be looking at is how do we restore the housing when, when the doctor talked about the vicious cycle, I mean, the vicious cycle of social planning around addressing homelessness in America is absolutely brutal on the people that are without housing in our community because it stigmatizes them. Now they're all mentally ill. They're all drug addicted. They're all from somewhere else. 
they're all lazy. They're all not to be trusted. You know, 20% of the city of LA is now off limits to unhoused community members because they don't want them near a library. They don't want them near a school. They don't want them near an AT. How can you take a, a group of people based on their housing status and determine that 20% of your freaking city is now off limits or the state of Tennessee says it's now a felony to camp on state property. So over the 40 years, we've continued to master that process, but somehow we can't build a freaking place for people to live. And we use low income housing tax credits and other ways, mortgages on public housing units, trying to incentivize a profit for somebody or some corporation off of the access for poor people to a place to live. De de not every housing unit has to be a freaking commodity in order to be a worthwhile endeavor. And decommodify your prison system, get the private guards out of there, get the private corporate profits out of incarcerating human beings and get the private market out of housing human beings. Thanks for that. Um, yeah, you said you said that you said that perfectly. Um, Dr. Wong, I want to invite you back in because I I actually think what you guys are saying isn't terribly in contradiction to one another. I think I think Dr. Wong, you would probably say we're doing these housing first studies because we know that housing people is effective at housing people. We know that, that it works, but people, policymakers, media often come and say, where's the research? We need the research on this. But I want to invite you in to see if you have any sort of responses to what, to what Paul said over the past few minutes. Oh, well, I mean, I, I agree with almost everything Paul said. It's uh, the truth is that, you know, programs like this, like Housing First can help specific individuals, but they don't change the fundamental causes of the problem. And you know the it's it's really it's it's dangerous to mistake you know to misunderstand what the what the uh, research is really able to show i mean i think that oh paul is thanks for standing paul because now everyone one of the questions was what's on the bottom of your shirt <laughs> oh, so sorry, I, don't, just, I, I, I don't sit still very well so i was always i was standing up but okay yeah, but now we can see that someone asked what's the yeah. message on the sub lower half of your shirt so it's good for us to be able to see that um i mean uh, so i i think that you know and it's interesting like i'm i'm a researcher but i think that we have to recognize the limits of research the the the, the political and economic structures and philosophies that paul's been talking about are not ones that are you know are subject to you know empiric research or randomized controlled trials they're actually the the domain of uh they're they're really more elucidated by the study of history and political uh and, and political science right so i think that it's just a it, we're, we're talking about two different realities uh and it's a mistake to think that you know us, us research is going to answer any of uh, the questions that Paul has uh, really spoken so eloquently about. Well, and, and I would like to to give a, a shout out to the House Keys Action Network in Denver, Colorado, that just put out what the kind of studies that we do with our without housing and now with this, where they talk to 828 unhoused community members in, in Denver about what kind of housing they've tried to access, what kind they want, what does a home mean to you when you say you want to put a home, and then base the research off of the priorities that people were talking about. Because another thing with the housing first has become these housing choice vouchers that everybody keeps hearing and then seems to be the growing trend, which is the most ironic name for a housing voucher because the choice is the landlord's choice it's forcing people out into the open market into the for-profit market with these vouchers they have four months to find a landlord because you know racism and classism don't exist in america anymore to according to the white people but they they oh like out of a thousand called in to apply for these vouchers 
seven actually ended up in a place to live. So that gives you an idea of the kind of intensity in terms of this program. And, and so we, we look at it as getting a, a sense of a priority listing from the community of what needs to be researched and then doing the systemic research to try to achieve those goals. And that's where the public housing units that have been lost, where the, the housing subsidies to homeowners versus housing subsidies for poor people is to amass the knowledge that you need to be able to rep your community with integrity, which means you gotta be following the lead of the community. I really wish homeless programs would talk to homeless people because we could have told you 40 years ago, what the fuck are you giving me a shelter for? I lost my housing, not my shelter. It wasn't lack of shelters that created homelessness. It was lack of housing. It sure as hell wasn't a lack of cops. It was a lack of access to treatment. And you see the demand for all of these things is miles long. It's not like people aren't telling us what it is they fucking need to address the systemic issue. It's that we're doing everything but addressing the issue systemically. And we're picking and prodding and are you left-handed or right-handed? Mind your own goddamn business. I need a place to live. I don't need it to be fixed by a case manager. Thanks so much, Paul. Yeah, I want to I want to uplift what you said about the importance of unhoused people driving policy. And same goes with any any person with lived or living experience, right? Unhoused people, people who use drugs, people living at the margins who know the problem best, who are closest to the issue, should be the ones driving policy, driving research agendas, right? Um, and that's why I, I hope people do check out um, the Pipe Dreams and Picket Fences report um, that Paul mentioned and that I dropped in the chat because it's a really incredible example of this community level grassroots driven research um, and, and sort of the insight that can come from that um, and, and can't always come from a peer reviewed, a peer -reviewed paper. Um, we have lots of audience questions, so I want to dive into those before I make you guys do some envisioning at the end because we want to end on a on a sort of dreamy note um even as much as i love to say fuck the system but i want to envision together at the end um but i want to move move to some audience questions i want to start with you dr wong because there are um a number of, of questions about um your study design and research methods um so first was there any difference in death or hospital utilization among participants who use drugs compared to control uh, so <clears throat> I think the question is, you know, did we look at that specifically only among the subset of people who were using drugs? And I have to say, we did not do a sub analysis uh, only for those individuals. What I can say is that we have done analyses showing that uh, in the entire population of people in the study, uh, that the housing first did not affect uh, death or mortality. So there was no difference between the two groups. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the yeah. So I, I I can't say if that was specific. Uh, we didn't do that analysis specifically for people who use drugs. Got it. Thanks. Yeah, that would be certainly an interesting follow up. And I also have to imagine that the the illicit supply, the un an unregulated supply, impacts that. Right. Like if people are continuing to use drugs, even if they're in even if they now live in a home, right? People are still access have access to the same toxic drug supply that's that's killing people who use drugs. Um, but yeah, that'd be an interesting follow up. Um, another question is: Did the did the providers undergo training for how to do harm reduction in housing first settings? And if so, what did that look like? Uh, well, yes. Yeah. So actually, one of the one of the strengths of the study was that. We really paid attention to fidelity to the the, the housing first model and and harm reduction principles. So all of the providers across the the, the five cities were trained in harm reduction principles. They were was actual assessment and monitoring over the course of the study to ensure that there was fidelity to the model. So actually, I would say that. The, the adherence to harm reduction principles was probably greater than you would see if, if you just like kind of rolled out a housing first program and without, uh, you know, careful uh, attention to that. 
Cool. Can you, are you able to speak on some of those specific, specific supports that were provided? So you mean in terms of uh, uh, training people in how, uh, in mm -hmm. harm reduction? Yep. So there was actually, so there were site visits by a, uh, you know, a housing first team that was experienced uh, in doing this approach. There was like, there was, so there was, there was group meetings, there was training sessions, both at the beginning of the project and periodically throughout the two years. So uh, it was very intensive, actually, and, and really, uh, I think, uh, uh, very well done. I can't, you know, I, 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 there, there is actually a lot of material on, you know, harm reduction within the housing first model that, you know, is well documented. I think that what is really important to note, though, is that it's one thing to go through a training program. It's another thing to live, live it and like practice it in reality. And that's really important to, to be aware of. Right, right. Thanks for that. I'm wondering if, um, based on what you presented, it doesn't look like you necessarily did, um, you looked at different types of illicit substances or drugs, but, but did you look at cannabis, for example, versus other drugs? Yeah, so uh, cannabis was not included in the substances that we were uh, assessing. So when we talk about substance use or substance use disorders, we're talking primarily about uh, opioids, stimulants, um, uh, opioids and stimulants. I should point out that this was uh, this study was done prior to the uh, you know the real toxification of the drug supply, so yeah. uh, it, it predated that. Thank you. Um, you you mentioned when we talk, talked a few months ago in preparation for this event um, that these studies were done in Canada, right? As you presented, but you don't imagine that it would be that it would look that different in the U.S. Can you speak? Can you speak more on that? And if you know of similar studies that have been done in the U.S. Well, the the the, the prototype typical study was done. Uh, by Sam Simbaris in New York City, and and uh, published prior to the uh, prior to us doing our study. Subsequent re studies have also been done in Chicago and in the San Francisco area. So there have been a number of studies of this approach. Uh, so I think that um, you know it, there's clear. I think there's clear evidence that regardless of the context, that it's effective. I think that again it does not really, uh, I think, address the underlying, you know, social drivers of homelessness, as Paul referred to. It simply says that if you apply this approach to individuals, then it's effective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hey, Paul, were you going to jump in? Yeah, I just find it ironic that when you look at residential treatment and the decimation of it, and then people become unhoused and now you create a new model like you know there's this poster from 1936 that the mayor of new york put out at the time laguardia talking about homelessness during the depression and it was why not housing must we always have this why not housing like I think there's no way you could do a study that says, oh, housing makes things worse for people. <laughs> like, so like it, it's kind of a no brainer. And I question HUD's ability to allow service providers to do the same model of, of housing first once they've set the priorities for who's eligible for the housing. Because in 2009, they redefined homelessness. You notice everything's been individuals, like as if families don't exist. You know, like we redefined families out of, it's just like we did with food stamps and now you're food insecure, like as opposed to freaking hungry. You know, mm -hmm. you're, ha you're poorly housed as opposed to homeless if you're doubled up or living in an SRO or couch surfing in order to fund housing first chronic homeless programs. They, re they redefine family and youth homelessness under the Heart Act. And now these families and youth were no longer eligible to receive homeless services. And they funneled that money over to doing housing first chronic homeless initiatives for visibly public unhoused community members. 
And then they tout it as a model and as a program that we should all emulate. And I think it's freaking sick. You're robbing Peter to pay Paul and you're putting families and youth at risk so you can funnel the money into the new flavor of the month. And that's just disgusting social policy. And I don't care how much you study it. It's mean, it's brutal, it's inhumane, and it's neoliberal as fuck. Can I just jump in, Paul? I actually want to say that, I mean, I think that what we're seeing is not a bug of the system. It's actually a feature. I mean, I think that the lack of affordable housing for, for regular people is the actually the, the expected and actually successful operation of the current system of creating housing for people. It's basically a capitalistic system where you take land, build housing to maximize your profits of creating that housing. And it is it's resulting yeah. in the outcome that we're seeing. And people are making a lot of money uh, with the within the current system. And I should add both builders and homeowners are making a lot of money off of this system and landlords, I should say. So there's and some service providers. Well, I'm sorry, but we've created a whole industry around poverty in this country. And, and I think the nonprofits need to really challenge their 501c3 status and really challenge, am I actually working for the system or am I trying to change the system and put, and anybody doing homeless shit could be trying to work themselves out of a job. And that's, the where we fail in addressing poverty in this country. And it's the legacy of the war on poverty with the whole 501c3 foundation nonprofit industrial complex where charity is the key to addressing poverty and racism in the United States. Somehow you can't do anything political. It's gotta be about charity. And that's as much of a overseer of the oppression and the colonization that we know are at the root of this of this shit we're dealing with. And I think we all need to be, myself included as the 501c3, need to be honest and real about challenging the fact that we're benefiting from other people's suffering. Mm. That's, that is a really great note <clears throat> to move into this last section where I wanna think about um, some policy and programmatic shifts. Um, so one one person asked um, about um, encampment sweeps um, and asked how we can shift policy to stop the sweeps, to stop the criminalization we're seeing happening on the ground. We, Paul, do you want to start with that? Yeah, you want to start with that, Paul? I'm sure you have sure. A, uh, something to say about that. Oh, no, I love cops. Um, we we have a we have a piece of legislation we wrote based on 2000 street outreaches that we did um, called the Right to Rest Act. It's currently running in in Oregon. We've run it nine times over ten years and gotten our asses kicked nine times at, at, in ten years. Um, it basically decriminalizes a person's ability to sit, stand, lay down, sleep, or eat in a non-obstructive manner. You would not think that this is a big controversial piece of legislation, but the League of Cities and the business improvement districts and the cops and the mayors go absolutely batshit every time that, that we've been able to get this bill introduced. And when you look at the historical pattern of criminalizing people with anti oki laws and sundown towns and Basarero Treaty and ugly laws, like this country has a long history of targeting specific individuals with laws that theoretically everybody is illegal to loiter. It's illegal to sit on a sidewalk for everybody, but you know goddamn well enforcement, they call it tools in the toolbox for local police departments and business improvement district security apparatuses. And standing still is a criminal offense. Sitting down is a criminal offense and targeted enforcement has been the rule of the law and has been the land of the law with local time, place, and manner restrictions is how they frame it. And it's targeting people to remove them, whether they're Japanese American, like with the with the anti with the the, the sundown towns, there's a, a famous a sign that we use 
from the 1940s. Hey, Jap, don't let the sun set on you here. Roseville is a white man's town. That was a California sign that uh, this community put outside. Now, you know the sun is going to set. You know people are going to stand still. You know people are going to sit down. You know people are going to eat. You know people are going to sleep. So you make that shit illegal for certain members of the community and you can target them and get them out of your, out of your neighborhood. That would be the first thing that would be on my plate for connecting the humanity of people that are unhoused with the historical oppression that this country is so goddamn good at and getting this shit off the books once and for all. And I think if they can't make us disappear, maybe they'll start listening to us and treating us like we're intelligent human beings. Dr. Long, do you have anything to add? Uh, I can just speak to the experience in Toronto where we had a number of encampments in parks and, uh, you know, the city decided, it, despite against the advice of advocates to, the, to clear the camps using police, the, uh, the, uh, the only thing, they did it at one or two sites and then they stopped and really the only thing that stopped them was there was uh, large scale demonstrators who resisted the clearances it resulted in like video of that was broadcast across the country of like incredibly, uh, you know, uh, uh, disgusting, gut wrenching scenes of police, you know, attacking and uh, uh, like assaulting protesters, and it just looked so bad that the city stopped. So uh, you know, I don't think that um, uh, sometimes I think that that you have to just resist because. It, the only thing that stops people is uh, resistance rather than argument. Right, right. Yeah, and, I mean, and that, that, that's talk. where we need to really build our, our base, our organizing base, as yeah. opposed to there's unhoused people demo, having a demo here, and there's kids not getting a decent education having a demo here, and there's like, like building a human rights campaign that encompasses all of these issues so that we can build the power. You get 400 people, you're gonna stop a sweep, but it's really hard day after day after day to get 400 people to show up at four o'clock in the morning to stop the pigs from sweeping us out of existence. Yeah, yeah, and Paul, a real you challenge. you mentioned Tennessee earlier and the criminalization of homeless and homelessness in Tennessee and right, like, we look there and the same, the same people the, who are being criminalized by anti-trans bills, anti-queer bills are the same people who are being harmed by Tennessee ref refusing to accept CDC money for HIV prevention and treatment, who are the same people who are being harmed by anti-harm reduction laws in Tennessee, right? It's all the same like underlying logic, criminalization and dehumanization. Um, so, big ups to mass mobilization and, and building across movements, as you both said. Can I just say, though, I think that, you know, if we're talking about the need for housing, that we, I think it's important to recognize that there's a lot of hard work and detail and like groundwork, uh, like technical know-how that goes into building, like not planning, getting the approvals and actually building affordable housing. It really does require um, you know, uh, a fairly uh, kind of uh, a, a very comprehensive and very skillful, like long-term approach. It's, I, and I just think it's important to recognize that, you know, the building that kind of, that kind of skill is important. We can't just say we need affordable housing because it, it's not going to appear just even if we say, even if we have people demanding it. It's not something that can be created, you know, uh, uh, easily. Right. Yeah. As, as Paul said earlier, I mean, I mean, it's it's gotten a lot more complicated because you have to use seven different funding streams to fund one freaking development. But you can decomplicate it. I, m me, and a bunch of friends, we started a housing corporation. It now has over a thousand units of of housing, specifically at the level that un unhoused community members can afford to live there. 
And it became a bear putting together one project because now you had to use seven different funding streams. You couldn't just write a grant to HUD and get a bunch of project-based section eights and do a project. Like we don't need to make it as complicated as we do. And, and trust me, my experience is if, if HUD puts the money out, the housing will appear. Like, like um, people need jobs. When you combine the development of affordable housing as an economic stimulus for a low-income community and you do local hire, you pay Davis-Bacon wages, you do all of those things attached to creating the housing units and putting in supermarkets and shit like that, and daycare centers, shit people need. You can really turn it into a revitalization. I call it gentrification without displacement. You can really improve the living conditions in a community through the prospect and the efforts of creating affordable housing for people. It's I, a lot of fucking fun too. <laughs> I mean, I also imagine, um, Dr. Wong, you're speaking to the, the sort of decades and decades um, long laws and policies, right, that have been, that have benefited developers, that have benefited landlords, that make it challenging to do affordable housing on a large scale, right? Like theoretically, I hear you, Paul, it shouldn't, it actually isn't that complicated, but there are massive barriers and massive sort of entities that um, don't want affordable housing for their own profit. And I should just add, I think we face a real issue with NIMBYism as well. I mean, just to be honest, that like we're trying to build affordable housing in Toronto and communities oppose it almost, uh, you know, uh, uh, uniformly. And that's where I find the criminalization and the dehumanizing of people that are unhoused so goddamn offensive. Of course, people like we for 40 years, We've seen newspaper articles, radio, ca political campaigns. My God, the, everybody running for mayor equates crime and homelessness. You would think that they were intersectional with each other. And so you demonize people and then you say, oh, we're going to build an affordable housing project in your community. You just spent the last 40 years telling me they're all from somewhere else. They're all crazy. They're all drug addicted. They're all dangerous. You don't want them near your daycare centers and your public libraries. But then you're going to bring the shit to my neighborhood and tell me that you're building housing for unhoused community members. We feed the NIMBY that exists in this community because we've dehumanized who it is that's living without housing. And we've separated us, unhoused people, from the rest of our community. And, and it should tell us that we need to be really cognizant of the way we're defining this issue, the way that we're dehumanizing people with intakes and screening and waiting lists and all that shit. And the way that we talk about poor people, we're no better off now than we were during the war on drugs or during the, the drug addict, the crackhead welfare recipients in the 1990s when, when, they, when they did the fucking um, Gindrich and Clinton did the welfare reform. Like we demonize the hell out of people and then we wipe out their support systems and then we wonder why there's so much racism and classism in this country. It's like, you fed it, you created the shit, deal with it. And instead our schools are gonna, you know, empty out the libraries because somebody might read about, um, you know, Rosa Parks or some shit. Like it's crazy. Right. I mean, I think uh, NIMBYism is unfortunately an issue that is that is perhaps growing um, and a huge problem for organizers in the housing sector, organizers, um, drug user organizers, lots of people. Right. Um, uh, so I'm wondering if, if either of you have have um, seen effective strategies for combating NIMBYism, whether it's in the development of affordable housing, um, you know, in, in our spaces specifically, we're, we're facing this with overdose prevention centers. A lot of people are saying, I don't want this in my neighborhood. So I'm wondering what sort of strategies you've seen to combat, to combat NIMBYism. I uh, guess if you, if you saw strategies, you wouldn't be in this. Yeah, maybe. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm not an expert in combating NIMBYism, but I guess that uh, I, I will speak to one thing, which is the, th this does raise the question of do we, do we go with scattered site versus congregate models? Because in my experience, built, 
building a building like a say a 50 or 100 unit building for people who were previous who are experiencing homelessness really uh, provokes a huge amount of nimbyism response. And this is more kind of a, about getting around it rather than solving it. But the, the, the advantage of the scattered site model with using rent supplements is that you're placing people in, you know, uh, community apartment buildings that where they are no, you know, they're just a resident just like everyone else. It's not like they, it is the building for people who were previously unhoused. So I think that, you know, that is one of the advantages of the, uh, of the scattered site approach. But it's not a solution in NIMBYism, it's a workaround. Mm. Paul, any, any effective organizing strategies you've seen? <clears throat> towards I mean, combating nimbyism this this narrative what we did at the the place that that we started um is really early outreach and also not the ones with the big mouths tend to be the most racist in the group and they tend to with my experience working with local government around this shit in San Francisco was they became the focus of the opposition and they became 90% of the air was taken up by the most radical fringe yep. of the NIMBY. And, and our strategy was isolate them, you know, and start early outreach. Don't already have your down payment on the building before you start talking to neighbors about you might be moving into the community. And make goddamn sure that you're not just saying, oh, but look, here's a nice tenant. They live in, like, if, if homeless and unhoused community people and poor people from the neighborhood aren't already a part of your project, you're starting really late in the game. Mm -hmm. And you better deal with it. Because the more local you keep those paychecks, the more you're benefiting the whole community. And so when you mm -hmm. have a really strong commitment to hiring from within the communities that you're doing your development project in, and you implement that before you start just talking about you're going to do it, and the more you're involving the community of people that you're housing and running the buildings and doing the rehab and, and being a part of the organization, the stronger your, your ability to combat nim nimbyism is going to be because you live there. That, that's an excellent segue into to a question that's been asked a couple of times, um, which is, are community advisory boards and lived experience councils a good way to grow that platform and amplify the voices we should be hearing? If not, what are suggested alternatives? I mean, maybe that, I can that, speak that to that. That came from Seattle. I guarantee you that came from <laughs> Seattle. Maybe I can speak to that <laughs> first. I think that there's a... I, I have to say, I kind of will take a kind of a yes and no approach to this, which is that speaking as a researcher, I think it's really essential that we listen to and build, uh, you know, our partnerships with community rather than approaching this from, uh, you know, an ivory tower perspective. And in that regard, I would say community advisory boards and lived experience councils can help us in, in the research world stay grounded and, and addressing questions that are relevant. Having said that, I'm not sure that that's really that helpful. I mean, that what's really helpful is having groups that are organized and advocating for systemic change in a way that, you know, is, again, not typically supported by research findings that of the kind that academic researchers do. And I realize, Paul, you're talking about other kinds of research, but I think that, you know, the, uh, I just think that sometimes there is a risk that we stifle the voices of people. Uh, and Paul, I'm sure you know, you would agree that, that rather than really elevating them. So I think it's really important that we realize that like maybe there's different lanes for a attacking this issue rather than saying we should all be kind of uh, having an advisory board. Yeah, I mean, you can pretty much tokenize any segment of the community and they sure as hell have done that with us. Um, I'm, I, from everything I've heard about the lived experience coalition in Seattle, they ain't being tokenized by nobody. They're, they're, so I think it's a matter of how you structure 
that entity. And, you know, it's unfortunate the community advisory, but the local homeless coordinating boards, that's bullshit. I mean, HUD's setting the, the, the regs and HUD is setting the priorities and HUD is driving the funding. So, you know, mandating that communities have local advisory boards is bullshit. Um, but having true community representation, I think, you know, the, the National Consumer Advisory Board of Healthcare for the Homeless based its structure on the 60s shit during when community health centers were first created. And a community advisory board when you're doing community health centers, like that kind of makes sense if you want to have community control over the priorities of the health center. It gets really tokenized when you get into the structures of poverty and disability rights and, and housing rights. It, it, and we, it's really a sign of just how much we look down on this community. It's why in Hawaii, they didn't get, I saw they didn't get a hearing on the Homeless Bill of Rights in Hawaii. We didn't get one last time in, in Oregon. Like another time we couldn't even get it introduced. Like that's how far down the road of dehumanizing we've gone with incarcerated and poor people and unhoused people, which is all of that. So, you know, I think having strong organizing bases that are from the community and accountable to the community can drive what a community advisory board or lived experience coalition or a homeless coalition actually looks like. It doesn't matter as much what we call it, it's how we structure it. Yeah, yeah, thank you both for those insights. And <clears throat> right, there's a difference between um, welcoming and asking for true sort of uh, community partnership and people driving, whether it's a research agenda or organizing process or a board process versus people coming up with an agenda beforehand and then saying, oh, we're gonna create this community advisory board. So it looks like we got community input, but we already sort of came to the decision beforehand, right? Um, I want to I want to quickly mention that um, we co-hosted a, a series last spring with National Survivors Union, formerly called Urban Survivors Union, which is the National Drug Users Union, on community-driven research. Um, and we'll drop some recommendations and resources for for doing community-driven research, sort of beyond the CAB uh, model, and looking more at like true partnership through every phase of the research process. Um, well, we're, we're nearing the end of our time, so I want to ask if each of you would say some final words and sort of um, a, a vision for housing um, that can include housing first and maybe beyond housing first. Um, but before I do that, I want to thank you both for a really rich discussion. You both said you wanted uh, some contradictions and some and some challenges, and I think you ra you both raised some some real challenges in talking about housing first and housing. Um, and I think it was a really beneficial discussion. Um, so with that, I'll ask you both to offer some final words. Um, Dr. Wong, can I start with you? Uh, well, I don't know if I can come up with a good capstone statement. I mean, I think that, um, you know, I think that it's just really, uh, it's important to realize, I think the both the, 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 the strengths and the real limitations of research to address questions that are really driven, uh, uh, that, that are really rooted at the, as I mentioned, at the systemic and rather than individual level. And, and so I, I just think that it's important to realize that while you know, research can provide really important insights into what works at the individual level, it's, uh, it, it has real serious limitations at looking at the, um, you know, uh, at least I should say health research or empiric research, experimental research has real limits in terms of looking at the root causes of, of, uh, of, of the problems that we're facing. I mean, I have to say that I, I you know, I continue to hope that we will accomplish change uh, that, that's just so desperately needed, uh, but uh, it is an ongoing struggle and we just have to continue onwards. Thank you. Paul? So like an ending, is that what I'm doing? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. This um, is I, awesome to say whatever. 
I, I would, you know, I do. Um, I, I would just encourage people to go to our website, uh, W-R-A-P-H-O-M-E, raphome.org. There's amazing artwork. We're in a bunch of different cities, so we find that posters and artwork um, speak really well to getting messaging out. And God knows people love freaking stickers, so we got lots of them, too. Um, clearly you've seen this one t-shirt, we have others, but like, like, and you know, when we do our actions, we combine it with street theater and music. Like this doesn't like, yeah, we're in a fight. Like we are deaf and you know, the key is, are you going to get up again tomorrow and fight some more after you get your ass kicked? Because we're not winning right now. So, but we can build community. We can have a really good party. We can do street theater. We can actually bring out all of our different skill sets and all of our different tools that we have access to when we come together as a community. And, and you know, Leo, I hate the term silo organizing, but the shit's for real. And the foundations drive it. And, you know, we're like, yeah. we're, we're not in competition with each other. We support each other. And the stronger we get, the more likely we are to actually be done with this shit once and for all and decommodify housing, education, and healthcare in this country. That's an excellent note to end on to, to remember against ongoing struggles for, for humanity and dignity and self-determination um, that we should remember creativity and joy and community amidst all of that. Um, so with that, Paul and Dr. Huang, I want to Thank you both um, immensely. Thank you. I want to thank our ASL interpreters for today and want to thank the audience um, for a dynamic conversation and chat. Um, like I mentioned, we will send out the recording in the in the coming days um, and look forward to seeing you at our next event. Thanks Yay so much. Yay to the interpreters. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Take care.